Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're doing well. I hope your mental health is great. And and if it's not, just know things will get better. And I hope you're working on it because uh, there's a lot of people who can help. I've, I'm, <laughs> I'm very sure of that with my own history. Um, this podcast is pretty cool. Uh, I met uh, Steve Hable through pole vaulting. When I was trying to figure out who I could you who I could interview for this podcast, Steve volunteered. And I didn't know a ton about his background. I knew he worked with with athletes and I and and that's about as far as when I knew he worked with pole vaulters for sports like type stuff. Little did I know he's worked in the prison system as a counselor or a therapist. I, I always get those terms mixed up. And he has some insane stories about that. I don't want to spoil it for you, but one involves a finger, a guy cutting off his own pinky. (laughs) Wow. So how do you work with those types of people? How do you work with people with mental health issues that are in the prison system? And, and how do you build empathy for, for people who have done some of the most horrific things you can imagine? Just a, just a great dude. I have nothing but kind words to say, and I just want to share everything we talked about. As a warning, there's some there are some dark things when we talk about mental health. It can get a little spicy. It can get a little dark. But that's that's important to talk about, I think. So it's it's a powerful, powerful episode. <laughs> I was changed by it. So uh, as always, to support this, onewholelifemedia.com would be fantastic. Pick up a shirt. Be a, be a billboard for mental health. That's what we're trying to do. Be, be a mental health reminder for somebody who might read your shirt. Also, uh, I'm thinking about still opening up a Patreon account. Let me let me know. I'm I'm curious if you guys would be interested. I could uh, open it up where you could ask some questions to the people I'm interviewing. Like leave a little section at the end where where Patreons get to ask the questions, and then I, I I give you guys those those answers just to you, Patreons only, um, as a way to support this. And the easiest way to support this is just share these around. I would really appreciate that. That would help me out. A whole bunch, and it helps spread the word in this message that we need to keep talking about mental health. Uh, so, Steve Habel, Habel Hobble, I always, I always say it wrong. So, Steve Habel is a mental health therapist in a private practice in Wisconsin. He has had his own practice called Fox River Consulting Center since 2011. He was also a prison psychologist at a facility called the Wisconsin Resource Center for 27 years. Uh, this is a mental health facility that houses Department of Corrections residents with mental health issues. In addition, he has also been involved with pole vault as an athlete and a coach for almost 50 years. He was an NCAA Division III All-American at Oshkosh, the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, where he also coached pole vaulters for close to 20 years. He left coaching over a decade, but returned to coach uh, at, his, at his kid's high school. Where he began, where he's been there for the last six years. He has extensive training in DBT, EMDR, as well as CPT, CPT, prolonged exposure, and other types of trauma therapy. He has also worked with a variety of athletes, mostly pole vaulters, on performance and anxiety and other sports related issues. Guys, without my further ado, I would like to introduce the amazing Steve Haywood. <laughs> Confucius said we have two lives, and the second begins when we realize that we only have one. We're all given one whole life. And when we find and break the barriers that are preventing us from living fully, we have an audacious attempt to improve mental health. One Whole Life with Sean Francis. So Steve, uh... First thing I had on my list was you, you've done all sorts of therapy from um, in, in corrections to pole vaulters to people experiencing trauma. I kind of w- wanted to start, if this is okay with you, in the prison mm-hmm. system because my wife is a correctional officer actually. So mm-hmm. um, I hear all sorts of stories from trauma from the inmates and the, the correctional officers themselves. Like, So what what did you do in the, in the prison system? And um, exactly. I was a... I started off in the prison system. I was uh, in the, the recreation department. So uh, like some people would say I played games all day. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, um, but I, 
I always, I had a different interest. And um, so I, I had a master's degree in counseling. So I was able to uh, transfer over into the psychological services um, department where I did treatment from um, the facility I worked at was an interesting place. It was um, a mental health facility, but the residents were all Department of Corrections inmates. And, um, and in the, the early 90s, they also, they made a law in Wisconsin, um, the sexual predator law. And so in order for that law to work, they needed to be housed at a place that was um, not a Department of Corrections facility. So mm -hmm. they all came to where I worked. And so uh, then I, I had to quickly adapt and learn how to do treatment for violent sexual predators. So what, what was the sexual predator law exactly? Um, it was a law that allowed them to um, civilly commit the violent sexual predators after their prison terms had ended. Okay. So they weren't inmates. They were classified as patients, although okay. they were uh, way more dangerous and more manipulative than the inmates were. That's and, what you found out through working with them or? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Huh. That's kind of fascinating. So what do you do with <laughs> somebody like oh, that? Oh, it was, it was, <laughs> it was intense. They, they actually made um, the therapist. We had to go uh, through therapy ourselves for PTSD from things that we had heard in really? sessions. And, um, and I, it's, it's kind of funny that like when this law was enacted, I had already been working there for uh, like three or four years. And eventually they built a facility for these folks and then they all left. But when, when they came, it was 1993. And when they left, it was 2010. Holy. And so <laughs> from, I was the only person who was there at the beginning and still there at the end. And wow. um, so I don't know, I, I, I remember going to trainings and people would ask, uh, why, why do you work with this population? And when I first started, there was like some old guy in there and he said, because I can. And then it just hit me. It's like, wow, that's me. That's no other reason. Same for me that I don't know how I could do that and listen to that, you know, being someone who like, I'm a, I'm a parent, I have four children and listening to like these stories the part of the therapy they had to, um, they had to recount everything that they did and no matter how nasty it was. And, um, and, and again, we had to talk about that in, in therapy and they, it was kind of a learn as you go thing. The, and, the parents um, had to re-go through that? No, no, like, no the I, like the patients. Oh, the patients, okay. Yeah, they had to they had to in great detail discuss their crimes and their like their thoughts that led up to it, what happened, when, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um some of them, you know, had some like hundreds of victims and some of them were like just nasty. It's a I mean I, I guess my way to cope at then uh, at that time was um, humor, yeah, and because I I learned, you know, like if I don't like let this stuff out somehow, uh, it's just gonna eat me up. And so it was it was humor, and I would tell people like I have a lot of stories I can tell at parties, you know, from. Think like people with animals, people, you know, and it's like, you ever uh, meet someone who, you know, did this, like, and I said, yeah, there, I mean, there were people who assaulted dogs and horses and in one case, a chicken, you know, and, and I mean, it was, um, wow. it, and, and so it's like, okay, I had to think of funny ways to tell this stuff. That, that was, I guess that was my way to cope. And, um, they, um, uh, so uh, there's oftentimes I'm very much an introvert, but yeah. I would find myself, you know, at, at like parties or social gatherings and someone would start coming over and talking to me. And pretty soon there'd be like eight or nine people around me and I'm just telling them stories of stuff that I saw in prison. Yeah. My and, wife does the same thing. I wonder if it's 
kind of the same thing that you're I, doing. I think I think so. I think it's a it's a way to cope. They call it like gallows humor. And okay. And you see, like she probably does too. You, you see things that if you haven't been in that environment, it's really hard to imagine. Yeah, she like uh, we had a talk one time because we we were at a pole vault camp and she was explaining to the parents. They're like, "What do you do?" She's like, "Well, I'm a correctional officer." And they're like, "Oh, I bet you have all kinds of stories." And so she went into a story about how a guy would. He was using his feces and spreading it all over the jail yeah. cell and on the ceiling. And then he was painting pictures with it. And she's kind of chuckling and laughing the whole time. And, and the pole vault crowd is just like, yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of mouth to the ground. And she goes, I, I just, I didn't know how to talk to him. And I, <laughs> I just remember telling her, maybe don't go straight to the feces story right off the bat. Maybe build up, to, <laughs> build mm-hmm. up to that one. But yeah, I, it makes sense though somehow you got to get that out of your head and Mm -hmm. um yeah they're trying to create a system now where uh the correctional officers go and have uh, a therapy or a counselor or someone to talk Mm -hmm. to at least once a month i think that's good because and they they even have a they have a more difficult job and i i would oftentimes i would do new employee orientation and i would tell them that i can't do my job if you don't do your job, you know, and, and so they, I can do mine because they do theirs, you know, yeah. and, and um, so, and, and they're, yeah, they're, they're vastly underpaid and they're, um, and for, especially for what they're asked to do, like you say, there's, there's things, and you know, I, I kind of laugh when you share that story. Cause it's like, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> finger painting. And like, I even went, one time I had a female therapist and this guy was writing her name on his wall in feces. And, and so like, I went and got her and like, look, see that he really loves you. And, and <laughs> like, wow, that's, that's what a way to impress a girl. I mean, we're talking like that. And, and it's like, and then you think about it, it's like, God, you know, this is what could, would compel someone to do that. And right. we're like laughing about it. But what else do you do? You know? Yeah. And, I guess in my role too, I would see a lot of the crazier stuff because someone from the psychology department has to be on call twenty four seven. And so when it and I was uh, for a long time, I was the highest uh, seniority or one of the highest seniority people. So um, if people didn't want to take their on calls, it would go down like the seniority line. And I would, if I wasn't doing anything that week, I would often take their on calls. And so. Cause they, um, that was my one way, I guess you could, when you were on call, you could choose time or money and yeah. I always chose time. And so I would get a lot of extra vacation for being on call, but they, they, I'd get called to go in the institution at any hour of the day or night. And the, I mean, it, the crazier times were like third shift and, um, it seemed like a lot of stuff would happen on third shift. And like the night shift is that third mm-hmm. shift yeah. yeah overnight and i'd go in and talk to people and do some of the like the craziest things i guess anything you could imagine i've probably seen <laughs> probably and then they like somebody would do something and if they would they had where i worked they had restraint beds and so they would put them tie them down in a restraint bed and only the psychology staff could let them out and wow. so then they'd call me, I'd come in and I'd talk to them and then like make a decision whether to let them out. And I was a person, I guess I had a reputation. They knew when um, I was uh, coming in there that my motto was like the least restrictive environment possible. So my mindset was I was going to let them out of restraints. <laughs> yeah. And, and on my way in, I'd have a, oftentimes have people trying to talk me out of it, you know, like don't. <laughs> They did this, and, uh, and I said, "No, you can't tie someone to a bed because they're a jerk. Uh, they, yeah. they have to be a danger to themselves or others. And so, if you they're in a room and you took everything away, that there's all that's in there are four walls and a mattress. There, there's not a whole lot they can do, and unless they start like banging their head off the walls, and, right? Which, yeah. which has happened, you know. And, and um. But yeah, sometimes they find stuff in their room. You know, they're very resourceful. Like I, some, somebody like had, I don't know how he got a pencil, but he had the back of a pencil and he took the eraser out and sharpened the metal part and cut his pinky off in this room. 
Holy. And, and it's like, and so, but then, you know, they asked like, Oh, what do you, how do you interact with those kind of people? And it's like, well, the same way I interact with anyone. Yeah. How do you approach that? And, like, and it's just, I would just go in and talk to them very like matter of factly. Cause I, had to figure out and I've often been told by people that, well, well, they're just attention seeking. I mean, that's, you hear that a lot in mental health, All attention the time, yeah. seeking, and then they just ignore them. It's like, well, even if they're attention seeking, why, why are they doing that? Like that's generally not the kind of attention that you want that there's still something going on why someone would do something like that. And so yeah. if they, if they are wanting attention, why do they want attention? You know, there's, so there, there's almost always something is going on and you can get something from, you know, some information and maybe talk to them. Um, I've had people that, I don't know if I can share one story that yeah, of um, course. often comes to my mind there. I had a person who was like, uh, he was very, very angry and a violent person. He was also someone who was transgender and like, he didn't like being a male. And so I, like, I knew this, I could talk to this, this individual, no problem and never have an issue, but was often like he hated authority, hated people in uniforms and they would. Uh, and so he would often get his trip to segregation where they'd lock him up. And then he'd, he'd try and like, you know, hit or spit on officers any chance he got, but only the ones who were like super rude to him. You know, there were some that were, he never bothered. And so this guy, one time they were, um, they were ready to strap him down and they, I was his therapist. So they called me. And so I went down there and, you know, I, I get to his room and there's like the windows, just a little like rectangle, and so I'm there at his door and I'm, I'm looking at him and, um, and he's still angry. He's, you know, and, uh, I figured, well, if all I have to, do, I can know how to calm this guy down and I just get him to talk about stuff and distract him some way. And he's, but he's pacing real fast and he's yelling and he's swearing. And, but then he saw me at his window and, then at first he started in on me too and calling me like uh, names and stuff. And I was, I was kind of ignoring him and I was, I was trying to look behind him. And then I saw like, for whatever reason, here's this guy, this angry dude, and he's yelling and swearing. And I looked on his, uh, in the corner of the room, there was a stack of books that like library books. And, um, and so it was like, okay, it's, it's something weird. You know, this guy, they're all afraid of him. They want to strap him down, but he wanted books. And I was trying to see like what they were. And one of them was the Bible. And there's another book. There was this great big thick book. And this book is called uh, my life by Bill Clinton. <laughs> and he wrote this. I mean, it's like, it's like <laughs> yeah, 900 it's, pages it's a big book. And, and so, that's what I like. I jumped on it because I knew I had I had already built rapport with them, and so I started asking them questions about those books. I'm like, "Did you?" I said, "Did you ask the library for those books?" And he's like, "Yeah. What? Like, what's it to you?" And like, and I'm like, "Have you read any of them yet?" And he's like, no, "Not, no." And I said, "Did you? Did you start reading that Bill Clinton book?" And he's like, "No." And then I said to him, I said, good, don't. And he's like, what? I said, don't read that book. And I said, it, and I explained to him, I actually have that book. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you know, that guy remembered everything about his life, like everything he ever did, like whatever year, whatever. I said, it's so boring. And, and that this was probably not, uh, but again, I had rapport with this guy. So yeah. it was, um, and he had, he was a guy who was like self-abusive. So he had scars all over his wrists and, um, and he, and one of them was kind of a fresh one. So, um, and I told him, I, like, I, again, I had worked with him for like a couple of years. So I, I had this rapport with him and 
like what I said to him was probably not something you would recommend, but I said, please don't read that book. I said, it's, I said, it's so boring. I said, instead of your wrists, the next thing you'll go for is your own throat. And <laughs> he looked at me and he just like, all of a sudden he just it like disarmed him. And he's like, you're crazier than I am. He said, you would say that. And then, and then actually, I didn't even notice this, but one of my other um, residents was right across the hall and he was looking out his window and I heard this noise and like he was, he had, it was like mealtime. He had his dinner in there. And so he spit his milk all over his window. He, he was laughing so hard. <laughs> and then, so then the three of us were laughing and talking and, and I just said, I, I, he said, I can't believe you said that to me about that book. And I'm like, well, you know, then I explained to him like the purpose behind it, you know, and, yeah. and that it was really like a way to like disengage that. Uh, yeah. You disarmed the situation. Anger. It's like, and, it's crazy. But the weirdest thing after that was then I went into the um, staff office and I said, you don't have to tie him down. He's all right now. And then they went and looked in the window and he was just sitting on the floor eating his food. Hmm. And, and then one staff person came up to me and said to me, you know, he's lying to you. He's just telling you what he thinks you want to hear. So you'll be easy on him. And, and I just, I said to him, I said, well, so I said, people lie to me all day long. And when you work in a prison, they, yeah. they come in my office, they lie to me. And um, if they do that, I can't, you know, they'll, they won't make progress and um, I'll still listen to them because maybe one day they won't lie. But I, I told that staff person, I said, well, even if he is lying to me and telling me what he thinks I want to hear, I said, you know, you, you called me down here because you couldn't manage him and you were ready to tie him down. So obviously you weren't able to control the situation, but you called me down here and you know, like five minutes later, he's eating his food and he's, you know, perfectly compliant. Yeah. And, and that's probably so, better like, for him too, right? Like yeah. he'll trust the staff or yeah. maybe not them, but at least you in the future instead of, oh, you're they come to tie me down again. And Yeah. And so that was, um, I always, and again, I, that wasn't anything I had planned to say. It's just like, okay. But then that, that really kind of hit me after that. It's like, yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter. Like their, their goal is uh, behavioral, like, okay, you want them to behave and their techniques weren't working, you know, like the kind of the fight fire with fire, the violence thing. And, um, yeah. but I, it was, I guess I have like tons of stories like that, but it, it's really the, um, that environment I think was what allowed me to kind of branch out and become the the therapist I've actually become. Um, yeah. Because it was, again, it's, you get thrown into those situations and, um, and how do you respond, you know? And, um, and I, I mean, one thing I can say is in, in all the years I worked there, nobody ever, ever hit me or ever even threatened me in all hmm. the years that I worked there. That's so interesting. I, I think that was, um, I don't know. Do you think, what do you think that is? You think it's like, I have a theory about connection, right? Like maybe people respond a certain way because they don't feel either connected to themselves or other people or their world or their environment or their community or something like that. And if you come in as somebody that, Hey, maybe there's more of a connection or rapport, as you said, that helps to rebuild that trust and see them as humans versus mm -hmm. what it seems like everybody else might see them as and I, I i'm projecting you know what the world might see them but you know an inmate you know you, you don't necessarily have a you, you see a villain right off the bat instead mm -hmm. of another human most of the time so i, I always I, wanted to like i always thought you know everybody in there is like somebody's son or yeah. brother or father or you know cousin whatever you know that there's they do have people on the outside. And I think one of the things I, I guess I had an advantage of in my position was I often uh, communicated with their family members and like, and for 
most staff in a prison, that's like completely taboo, but the, the therapist can do that. Hmm. And so I, I had, you know, people's parents or their children or some calling my office all the time. And I would talk to them and I, I would actually, I would let the inmates, you know, make phone calls to their family in my office with me there. And it was always on speaker phone. So it was, and, um, I think that helped a lot too. And I, and especially to, um, I guess, separate the person from what they did, you know, to right. get put in there. And, um, for most of them, they're, they're either going to return to society and, you know, you hope that they, you know, something you did will keep them from doing, you know, what they did before to get locked up. Or if there's someone who's never going to go home, um, maybe it'll teach them to, you know, I guess, you know, something you did would help them wherever it is that they go next, like yeah. to, to the next institution. So, so I got two questions. Well, I got a lot of questions. <laughs> you're, you're making questions pop up in my head, but how many, how many people do get rehabilitated or have you seen, like, is, do you have a, a stat or a number or something where that um, helps? I know like the, the facility I worked at was um, one where a lot of them were uh, the only way they can get sent there is if they have a, a mental health diagnosis, like, okay. a, and, and so they, uh, and they say, well, generally like those people aren't as successful, but I know like also since I, I retired from that job uh, more than five years ago now, um, I, when I would meet with them, I would often tell them uh, the ones who are going to go home to make sure that you find somebody in the community, uh, you know, uh, to continue your therapy, someone you trust, someone you have rapport with. And uh, so that you can continue this when you get out there, because that's, there's certain things that help people stay out. And that's one of them, um, like uh, a source of incomes, one uh, supportive uh, people around you. Um, a, a roof over your head um, and, you know, other kinds of connections, whether it be, you know, faith-based or um, therapy-based. Does it, does it work so, similar in the same way, like with trauma, you know, like you yeah. have to create a new pattern in your head, right? So you have to mm -hmm. create a new pattern outside uh, in your environment, right? Or yeah. else you just fall back into those old patterns. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an expert, but if you don't create that pattern sooner than later, once you get out, I'd, I would bet it's pretty easy to fall back into that for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, it, so it, the interesting dynamic to like this part came about when uh, once I left there uh, and there'd be people who are going to get out and they want to have therapy in the community. And then they come across me and they're like, okay, you know, you told me this stuff and I, I, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't take them as clients. So yeah. I, I actually have like about, I think five or six uh, clients that I work with who I was their therapist in prison. That's awesome. And, and, um, and they've all, they've been out, for quite a while. And there's a couple of them I didn't, I didn't think would, um, would last this long. And, and like one guy in particular, he's been out for like six or seven years. I never thought he would be out and wow. stay out. And, but they're, they're not all like that. I had one of them just, in fact, just a week and a half ago, I, I saw on the news that, that this guy died in a shootout with the police and Oof. he had like, uh, armed robbery and he had carjacked a couple cars and got into a chase and an accident and then came out, he had a gun and they shot him. And, hmm. um, but he, you know, again, he like, he had, he didn't reach out for help and he had you know, drug and alcohol uh, issues. So, yeah. um, but it's still sad to read that. And then, you know, uh, and you see it on social media. And then there's one comment after another going, good. He deserved it. He's a thug. He's this and that, you know, it's like, I, I knew him, you know, differently. And, yeah. um, and it, it, it's still, and I, but I can't say anything. I can't like comment on a social media post and saying, you know, this, I was this guy's therapist and 
prison. No, I can't say that. So yeah, um, you'd probably start getting attacked too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, at that point, especially how and so mean it's like, social media can be. Um, but yeah, so it, it's that's a big thing, and um, a, a lot of people. It's really hard for you know someone who was incarcerated to find a therapist, and um, well, I have you know that background. So are um, therapists just scared to take them? Is that yeah the, the cases? Yeah. And I would, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go down a different road real quick with you, but right. do you know, most of the, most of these guys that you see in there, is it coming from some kind of trauma in their past that's creating this or bad childhood uh, environments or, um, I would say, uh, and this is the, again, there's no, no research. It just, no, I'm just asking me, your experience from, I would say a, a vast majority. Yes. Yeah. And, um, there are, there are some that, that, you know, you wouldn't, if you, you dig into their files and stuff and you're like, Oh, geez, they don't have anything, but there's usually something there. And yeah. I mean, some, there are people who are like inherently evil and it's like, okay, uh, but those aren't like the ones that I would usually see. They wouldn't come to a mental health facility. Um, yeah, where do those where do those go? They, they just kind of stay in maximum security. Okay. Um, if they're, but if they're like, well, the other, the other interest like they, there's a test, you know, to determine if you're a psychopath or not. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and most it's kind of funny, but. but the majority of people who are like very high in psychopathy are not in prison. Hmm. <laughs> they're, they're in, they're out in society and other professions, you know, <laughs> the billionaires. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah, a, lo- a lot of them. Yeah. It's like, cause those traits are like, sometimes those traits are valued and those people, they don't care who they step on to get where they want to go. And, you know, a lot of them are very, like they call them uh, glib and superficial, but they can be very, very charming and yet like totally devoid of any feeling, you know, so, but they can act like they are. So instead of sexual abuse, they use it to create yeah. businesses or something or whatever mm-hmm. else. That's, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of scary in a way. Um, yeah. They say I, that a lot of them are in politics or, oh, really? <laughs> or lawyers. Yeah. And, and, not a joke, like for, for no, real. No, yeah. <laughs> oh man. That's, that's even scary <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, it gives me some empathy for that though, for if if people are doing these horrific things and knowing that, you know, maybe it's coming from a place of hurt or, or something that happened in their Mm -hmm. past, it, it does help me have some empathy for that to go. I I think of like a dog, you know, if you hit a dog and it backs into a corner and then a Mm -hmm. kid comes towards it and it bites a kid or something. I mean, you could be like, that dog just bit a kid, but you're like, well, that guy just beat the dogs. So, you know, there's Mm -hmm. a response that came from that. But, um, I guess, I guess my question I've, I've had, and I don't know if this is too taboo, but you said you dealt with sexual predators, Mm -hmm. um, too. Like where, how do you, how do you create empathy for someone who does something to a child or something like that? You know, that, that's, that was the, um, the biggest, I guess, moral dilemma that I had that Um, you had personally. Yeah. And, uh, because you know, you're, you're, they, you kind of learn to try and separate the person from the act, but when that's the act, it's just like, um, I don't know that, that that's what drove a lot of people out of, you know, from working with them. And that was for some the one, reason huh? I stayed and, and it, when I just thought of what, you know, what that other guy said when I first started was, uh, why do you do this? Because I can. And then I, I, then I thought it was like my duty because I saw so many people come and go. And for whatever reason I could work with them and it, it did, it fundamentally changed me though. Um, yeah. Good and or bad or just, well, there's just cer- change. certain ways, and I, I bet you if if I actually I think when we were talking on the phone, we might have touched on this, like because I would be willing to bet that your wife has some of the same things. And uh, like number one, um, there's um, 
and this that might be not just sexual predators, but just in general, that the fact that, you know, when you, you go into a public place, like a restaurant, you, you tend to, I will like always sit in a booth and always like against the wall. She and, does that. Yeah. And, and like, I don't want anyone behind me. Right. So if I can be in a corner against a wall where she I wants, can see yeah. everything and I can see escape routes. Yeah. Like I, I, I kind of look at like other ways out. Um, I, uh, so th- there's that. And then you know, some people might look at that as being paranoid. Um, another Cautious. thing I had was regarding children. Um, there were certain things that, um, and I, I actually talked with my wife about this cause I was like, I thought, is there something wrong with me? You know, that when my kids were really little and they were in daycare, I, I would, if we went to talk to the daycare people, like uh, as a potential placement, if they had a male employee, my kids didn't go there. Hmm. And that was like that. And that was like a deal breaker, like no male employees. Um, when I took them to their sporting um, events, like every little thing they did, um, I would be the parent that would be sitting there the whole time while they're practicing. Like a lot of parents drop their kids off and then leave. Yeah. I never once did that because like, I don't really know who these, it, and it was because I worked with so many sexual predators who I mean, were their a, backgrounds. Yeah. worked in uh, daycares or they were coaches or the other one. Like wow. I, I had a group that, and it was kind of crazy. Now I, I make jokes about it, but I had a group that had five Catholic priests in it. And, <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> Okay, you know, I mean, you can make like insert joke here, but you know, and, right? It's real and, life. And then there was, uh, and then the other one was like people. They were a lot of them got involved in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, and like I, I tell people, I was really overjoyed the day my son told me he didn't want to be in the Cub Scouts. <laughs> it's like I, I was just, I was nervous every time, and, and so that's you know, it affected me in that way, like a lot with kids, and so, uh, and then I. I I have a, well, again, I'm sorry. I, I go off on tangents. I have no, this other story. This is, it's all fascinating. Um, I had a, I was at a kid's birthday party and I don't know if it was like one of, I think it was one of my kids. And so there's a bunch of kids there and their parents and it was at a Chuck E. Cheese. And, and, you know, so they're all having their party, they're playing and, and, you know, the, the kids are running around in the, the part where the like playground areas, the, like those, gross ball pits yeah, right. and stuff. And so I, I walked up there and, and I got, this was something I, I don't consciously, I didn't even do this. And um, I didn't, I guess I wasn't even aware of what it was I was doing, but I was standing there watching these kids play. And one of the other uh, parents who is, is, was a friend of mine from when we were like in college, he, he came up and started talking to me. And I just, I remember saying to him, um, like he wanted me to come back because all the adults were back there talking while the kids were up here playing. And I said, I'm going to hang out here uh, for a little bit. And he's like, well, and he knew me. He's like, what's going on? And then I just blurred out to him. I'm like, those two, see those two guys over there. I said, I think they're child molesters. (laughs) And he's like, and I didn't even notice them like at first. And then he looks at them. And then he's like, well, what, what makes you say that? And then all of a sudden it's like, this just clicked in. I did it. I had to have done it subconsciously. I said, they're not with any kids. Like what wow. adult goes to Chuck E. Cheese? Well, you, you don't go there to eat their pizza. And, <laughs> no. and, and I Maybe said, and like they're, giant mice. <laughs> and they're sitting in a booth, like right next to the, like the playground area, the ball pit thing. And, so I get what I did was then I stood there and he said, well, I'm going to stand here with you then. And, and it was funny cause he's intimidating. He's like a six foot three black man. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, so he's intimidating. <laughs> and so we're just standing there and pretty soon, like those, these two guys, like they kind of looked like they were nervous. They got up and they left and no kids left with them. And, and he looks at me, he's like, how did you know that? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, you work with those people all the time, right? Yeah, and and then I I figured like, okay, it has to be like just something you learn when you work in an environment like that. And it's like you're like you're 
radar is always up or something. And so that, I mean, oh that's gosh. how it affected me. Um, that like, I, I was like always on alert going places and, you know, it, it, I know there's a fine line between just being aware of things and being paranoid about things, you know, that, um, but, you know, I guess th that, that was an effect. And it, interestingly enough, like when they made us go to therapy sessions, when we were doing this treatment, that's what I wanted to talk about to the therapist. And um, all the therapist wanted from me was stories. And they're like, I would go in there and she would ask me like, do you ever work with anyone who killed somebody or who did this or that? And then and in my head, I'm thinking you're supposed to, we're supposed to be talking about how this affects me in yeah. my life outside of here. And you want war stories. So I gave them to her and I just, I started making up stuff <laughs> like that, that cause it, like she seemed to get really animated the, the, the weirder and grosser things I would tell her. And then, so that's all I did. And then it like, eventually they, they decided that we didn't need to have the therapy because enough people were saying the same thing. It, it wasn't effective. And, and was it just a bad therapist though? I at, think so. It point? was yeah. because it, it was, um, they weren't I there for you. It, it sounds like, no, <laughs> and it's hard to, again, it's like that, that world is so different and it's hard to, um, to convey those things that you see and hear to someone who doesn't really have a clue as, as to how to, or what it's like in there. And um, yeah, that's why I think, you know, like, again, um, like it's important, you know, for your wife to have outlets for that too. And there's someone who yeah. like list listens to her and doesn't want to just hear that like war stories and stuff. And that, that's I, why like yeah. now in the current, um, uh, in the current world now, I, um, I work with uh, a number of employee assistance programs, including the one in Wisconsin that um, works with the Department of Corrections. So oftentimes if something happens in a correctional institution, whether like a, a staff, like usually if a staff member dies or like suicide or uh, something traumatic or tragic like that, they, the, uh, the state EAP will send, you know, people in there for like crisis work. And so I often get sent into facilities like because of my background and, and that goes a long way that I, usually they're very leery of people from the outside. Like I, yeah. I think the first time I did it, I came in the room and I could, I just looked around and a bunch of like grizzled veteran <laughs> correctional officers sitting around this table where one of their co-workers had committed suicide and they're like so you're bringing in some you know some outside person who has no idea in to talk to us and then they they well they, they also gave me like these handouts then they were like educational about well this is what could happen when you know uh, suicide yeah. and and so um they had me introduce myself and so i introduced myself i then I told them my background and it was like, everything changed. They're like, Oh, he's one of us. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, he's one of us. And then I looked at the sheet of paper and I said, well, they, they gave me this to go through. And then I just, it was maybe overly dramatic. I just threw it on the table. I'm just like, we're not going to do that. Yeah. And I said, let's talk about this. And, and, um, and then like I started, I, I shared a couple of stories and um, then it was, you know, like two hours later, they're still talking uh, about things. And because um, I, I, I guess one of the things I said was about this environment and people not understanding the toll it takes on the people who work there. Yeah. And it's, um, it is, it's unique. And people, you know, they, they, it's hard to understand, you know, that what it's like in there. And, uh, and I, I said, you know, you, you take care of everybody else right. and you're expected. So your coworker commits suicide and guess what? You have to go to your shift and yeah. you have to watch, you know, the, these same people. And while you're taking care of all of them, you know, you can't, you know, you can't show emotions or be human. You can't let any of that out. And I would always ask them, well, who takes care of you while you're taking care of everybody else. And so it, it 
it it kind of you know it it disarmed a lot of them and turned into some yeah. uh, good discussions. Where where was I know you can't say the name exactly, but was it a business that you said that happened at? Oh no, it was it was a maximum security correctional. It was a correct. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I I just had that same conversation with my wife because as much as I want to relate to her, like I'm never going to be able to because I don't work in corrections. So mm -hmm. she she can only talk to people who are in there, yeah. you know, who get it or, and they have peer support groups like that. And she just mm -hmm. actually became one of those, uh, peer support person to, to help with that stuff. But yeah. And then as you were saying about, you know, you're back against the wall and arrest, she does the same thing. And even if we go to Walmart, she can point out who's doing meth mm -hmm. and heroin and Coke. I'll tell them like, yeah. stay away from that one and that one and that one and that one. We're going to take a hard right here and then we'll work mm -hmm. our way back to the food, you know, on the backside. It's, it's yeah. just, I would have never known. I was just like, oh, maybe acne or something. Yeah. I just don't recognize it. But yeah, it's a, it, it, there, <laughs> there's a lot. I, I, I guess I'm still just curious, like at what point can, can those, can those people be rehabilitated? Like the, the, the childhood sexual predator type people at all? Or, or is it just like, where, I, I don't I even guess, know where that comes from. I, yeah, I had this. I, guess I don't know if I, if I didn't believe that I, I wouldn't have been able left, to do right? it. Yeah. yeah. And um, I know that they, what statistics show there's certain, uh, certain categories where they're less likely to reoffend. You know, okay. that uh, generally, like if, if it was someone who assaulted like their family members, um, then it's like, okay, they're, you keep them away from their family members and they're all right, little kids. And, and like in the old days, you know, that, that was people would talk about, oh, I had like a creepy old uncle or whatever, like don't go by him. And, yeah. and, uh, but nowadays it's, you know, you have to take steps to, um, I get and you realize that back then, a lot of times a generation or two ago, people just covered up for their family members and like that, their, their philosophy was, well, we're just not going to go to, you know, uncle Bill's yeah. house. And, um, but they, a lot of times in that case, they don't reoffend. Um, okay. The well, ones it, who, I guess the ones that are most likely, um, I don't know if the re if statistics have changed uh, it, since I last looked at it, but it would have been people who are like willing to have victims who are strangers and also okay. same gender um, is also an indicator. A lot of times that they seem to be more likely to reoffend. Hmm. It makes me sick talking about this, <laughs> but, but uh, I've had I've had that question only because I forgot where I heard it, but someone brought up the question like years ago. It was wrong to be a homosexual, and there was no place mm -hmm. you could go to get help. And they were trying to do conversion therapy and all sorts of this other stuff that yeah. didn't work, and it was wrong. And now it's like accepted, you know. And I'm not saying sex being a sexual predator should be accepted, but I've always wondered if there was a place that those people could go to get help or if it's always just uh, something you have to live with alone by yourself or I've, I've had all theories, like maybe they turn to religion, you know, celibacy. Mm -hmm. And then that's why maybe some of these priests yeah. end up doing that. And I don't, I don't know the answers, but I've always wondered like if, if there really was a place to get help and if they could. So that's the only reason I'm, I'm in a lot of cases. I don't know who else to ask. <laughs> in a lot of cases too. It's not, it's not a, even about sex. It's about power and control. And, oh, and okay. That, um, and so, you know, I've taken that approach on them as, uh, you know, okay, what in their life can they control and what, you know, can they, oh, not? So like so a they, child. They, yeah. Ugh. And some of them are like, children or they're, they're childlike yeah and if you talk to them and you're like uh, yeah they're kind of like kids in adult bodies you know that so I, is that lack so of again i don't know what or, or i don't know emotional maturity or I, I think the emotional maturity has something to do with it and again then there there are your various like psychopaths that just it's a game to them and they just Ugh. like to prey yeah. on people and huh 
So, and again, like I'm one, uh, some of those people, like, no, don't let them out. You know, <laughs> right. they, they will continue to do that. And, but not all of them, you know, they're, yeah. um, well, I'm, I'm happy you were there, you know, like, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you've had some pretty awesome success stories with, you know, people who, and I don't know what the crimes were and I don't expect you to share, but like, uh, I bet it has to feel pretty good that you were able to be in a place that dark, you know, for somebody to be yeah. put into prison and to help them be rehabilitated back into society. You know? I think it also met my, um, a need that I had and it, and that also kind of shaped my, the way I do therapy. And that's, um, to find meaning and purpose in what I do. Yeah. And, um, and until that, point like i i was one of those people who i got and i share this a lot in sessions too that it it seemed like i just wandered aimlessly about my life for most of my life it just seemed to end up in certain places and in the end it was like well this is where i was supposed to be all along and how did, how did you know that i st i feel like i'm wandering right now <laughs> well i it's, it's it, again i can I'll share like this story even like the private uh, mental health practice, how this came about, or even me getting a degree, a master's degree in counseling. I, I, my intention was never to be a mental health counselor. Really? No, I, I wanted to, um, cause I, I, I had been a college pole vault coach for 20 years. And yeah. I thought this was my, the only way that a university was going to hire me, um, <laughs> as a staff member right. was, if you know for me to be like a staff and i thought okay what kind of degree can i get and so i went and oh counseling and i could be an academic advisor i could work in the counseling center or career services or all and so that's what i did i went to grad school and my intention was i wanted a university job where i could continue to coaching coach pole college <laughs> pole vaulters and um and so, and it's fun. My, the emphasis area of my counseling degree is higher education. Hmm. <laughs> it's not mental health. And so, um, what year was I, that? Or when, when did you do uh, that? It was, that was in the, um, uh, I graduated, I started in like 93 and I okay. think I, I finished in 97. Okay. And, um, coaching pole vault the whole time too. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> so it worked. And I, and I continued, <laughs> yeah, I continued, um, coaching at the university until like 2004 or something okay. somewhere in that area and um when and then when it just didn't become feasible for me because my hours and everything so um and then my kids by this time I, I by 2004 now i have four children and a baby you know and, and they're all like um a couple years apart and so it just there's no way and but i I applied for like every job you could think of at universities and I would get interviews and they would never hire me. And at some point I just, um, kind of stopped. I, you know, and at, when I switched at my work, I switched from like activities to psychology. I'm like, okay, I really, I really like this. And, um, and then, as luck would have it, the, uh, um, the other psych staff who I shared an office with was starting a private practice. And so every day I go to work and she would tell me like what she was doing and all of a sudden showed me like, Oh, well, we're going to rent this building out. And, and it's like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And one day I just joke, I jokingly said to her, like, you don't have any male therapists. <laughs> and then she, then she's like, yeah, you're right. And then the, the next day at work, she comes back to me and says, you know, I think you're right about that. She said, you want to be part of our practice? And I was like, okay. And, and so that's kind of what it was. And I'm like, yeah. okay, what do I need to do? And then so I kind of learned the ropes as to what I needed to do. And, um, and then, yeah, I like, okay, I'll be part of this private practice. Cause I, I kind of wanted something to do like, that I could be able to do when I retired. And at that point, um, I thought it would be, uh, I don't know, 15 or 
20 years. Cause I was like in my uh, late forties at that time. And okay. I thought, well, I got, I'm going to work until I'm like at least 62. And so if I can get on the ground, you know, doing this, that, that'll be pretty cool. And so it, it just, I, I, I think what I was looking for in life, I found in that uh, profession. And then I, um, it didn't feel like work. I mean, I would work all day in a prison and then at night I'd go and do therapy sessions in the community. Hmm. And I, I had clients who would come in and say, how can you do that? And I'm like, this isn't work. Hmm. Uh, this is, you know, it, it's an, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to be here for you at this time. You're like, whether it's trauma or depression or anxiety, whatever you're struggling with and you reach out for help. And I am like so fortunate to be in a position that I can help you. And um, that's how I looked at it. And it was like my like 15 year plan at that time turned into six. <laughs> and so six years after I started the private practice, I was, I retired from the prison and, hmm. and then, and the other nice thing was, once I retired from that job, I could become a coach again. <laughs> yeah. And so it came full circle, but now I coach at a high school instead of a college. And so. Do you get the similar um, fulfillment from um, counseling that you do coaching then? Yeah. And they're, they're, and they're also kind of intertwined. Yeah. You know, you're kind I, of, I really, you're kind of a therapist if you're yeah, a coach. <laughs> I, I, I really believe that because I like, um, I was told when I, decided to go back and coach at a high school. I was told by people who, who knew me or that they're like, you're not going to be successful at high school. And, you know, you've been out of it for too long and like your personality style doesn't mesh with high school kids. You know, like they're, they're lazy. They, you know, they're, oh, they're unmotivated, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And they're like, they're going to talk back to you like they're going to take advantage of you because you're too nice. And I worked in a prison, man. <laughs> and it's like, I, but I, that's how I was in prison too. Like I said, yeah. like the drill sergeant stuff doesn't work in there either. Yeah. You know? And, um, but I, what I found is that now nah, that hasn't been the case, you know, that right. um, it's, I think it's the same. You, you, you build up rapport with your athletes and you know, it, it's, they respond. I, I don't like, I'm not one of those people that ever yells or, you know, and even like at practice, I, I don't know. I know I sent you some resources and the one of them, like a friend of mine told me about this book called the inner game of tennis and where they, in that book, they talk about, you know, like coaches who, again, it's not, doesn't just pertain to tennis, but anything that, you know, you pole vault, especially like the, do you feel like the need to correct something on every practice vault that somebody takes, you know, or like, you, like you have to say something every time it's like, no, I think, I think young coaches do, you know, yeah. and I, 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 I think as you get older or, or your coaching age, I, I call it coaching age gets older. You get to just let the athlete play more because mm -hmm. it takes they, reps. They do, they, yeah, they learn a lot more of that, you know, that to become, especially in, they're more in, in tune. pole vault that yeah. they to be a, aware of your body and how a movement feels you know that's that's why there, i wish there was like some of these coaching aids that weren't there when i was vaulting you know it's like god i, I would have loved to have had an angle bar or a swing up <laughs> rack <laughs> right it's like oh i have them now but yeah um, but yeah it, i would have loved to have used those and and we have yeah, we didn't um Again, they, I mean, they, everything that I learned back about the pole vault and when I was younger is like wrong, you know, that's like, well, people, yeah, are, it's still, people are proving it now. It's like, um, it's still changing too. You know, it's, I, I, I call them fiberglass cowboys, you know, that in the early seventies, mid seventies, when fiberglass was kind of coming around and you had this era of guys trying to learn the event and they had no idea what they were doing. They were 
literally riding a fiberglass bull trying to figure it out on the fly. Mm-hmm. Like Joe Dial has stories of him putting helium in his pole to mm-hmm. try and make it lighter, you know? <laughs> and then the he was one I, I, I followed him, you know, because yeah. Joe, like Joe Dial and Billy Olson, and they, yeah. like, they're like the same age as I am. Oh, really? And, and so it's like, yeah, I, I remember reading that, that, yeah, like he, yeah, he put helium in a pole or he tried to vault with it like upside down to see if it made any difference. And um, yeah. And you'll still talk he, to him and be like, there's left-handed poles and there's right. <laughs> they'll just try and mess with you. Like people <laughs> would, you know, they'd cut their poles at a certain place. You know, like I, I knew people who bought a pole and they, they would cut it all the time. Like either. And some people said, Oh, it cut it at the bottom. Some people cut it at the tops. And yeah, I went to, I thought that, I went to a meet once and Jacob Pala is an 18 foot pole or a 19 foot pole vaulter. And he literally pulled a hacksaw out of his bag where his spikes were and started hacking off about three or four inches off the bottom of his pole, put the plug on, picked it up and ran and, and took a jump. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and I've never saw that before. So I remember running back to NDSU telling the coach, you're like, you're not going to believe what Jacob did. He pulled a saw right out of his bag, started <laughs> sawing his pole down and we were all just <laughs> those were like 750 dollar poles and he's just hacking away at yeah. it but i guess uh, when i talked to him about it, it just it makes it roll into the pit a little bit easier for mm-hmm. him so you don't have to grip down on the pole you can grip the top of it where the sail piece is supposed to be and it, and it works but i mean but that's the stuff that even me coming up through the system like i had no idea what any of I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. There wasn't a lot of resources or information mm-hmm. out there. I grew up with one book, like that beginner to Boopka book mm-hmm. and YouTube wasn't around yet. So you yeah. maybe had some, I had a video, a VHS coach gave me at a camp and, um, oh, what was his name? Don Hood gave me a, a VHS tape too. So you watch mm-hmm. that until it's falling apart, yeah. but that's all we had. <laughs> I had that. I had, yeah. Like mechanics of the pole vault. You know, yeah. like, uh, that, that one too, that's, that was around and yeah, it was interesting. And, it, um, that they, and, and again, like I, I see, I, I keep trying to learn because I, again, like the, the stuff I was taught when I was younger, it's like, it's, I'm learning that a lot of that was all wrong. I, and now I'm I like, like maybe like a lot of old people and like, uh, if I knew then what I know now, you know, like, yeah, yeah. it's like, man, I, I wonder how high I could have made uh, because um, I know things now, but I like physically, I can't do those things. <laughs> so, well, I, I feel kind of the same way about you though. Like with there, I don't think there is a way to pull. I mean, that's why I wrote it on the cover of my book. It's like, there's more than one way to pull vault. And I mm-hmm. think it's the same as maybe I'm, I, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but working with, with people in, in a therapy s- session is mm-hmm. you coach the person, not try and lump them into a model yeah. or I'm going to make everyone do cognitive behavioral therapy. And you're like, well, that might not work for that guy or girl. So uh, mm-hmm. we got to, I got to get to know you, build rapport, and then, you know, try and work with what tools I have available to you. Mm-hmm. And that's how I look at the pole vault now is it's just a g- big game of physics and everybody has different levers and speeds and and psychological things that can help or break you in the pole vault and so mm-hmm. if you have all of the tools then you're better adapt to help more people and that's how i've that's how i look at the sport now but that's what mm-hmm. i'm trying to pick up as many tools in the, <laughs> the psychology well, that, side of I, things well, as well i, I got that to. you know too from from your book and all your videos when you always say, Oh, there's more than one way to pole vault. And it's like, okay, there's a way like every person does things differently. And then I, I, I do, that's how I feel as a coach. Like I, I want to tailor things to them. Like what can they do? Like, I, I don't want like 10 kids pole vaulting all exactly the same. Right. Yeah. It's like, so no, they, again, they, they, there's certain things that, you know, some do better than others. And, you know, that in the end, it, it's about like getting over the bar. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And people forget that it's not a beauty contest. You just mm-hmm. <laughs> got to get over the bar and have it stay up. Yeah. You know? And that counts as a make, you know, the prettier ones usually <laughs> go a little higher. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's, that's the goal is just run with the stick and go over a stick. Yeah. And, yeah. 
Yeah, I read that. I, I don't know if it was you or somebody else. Yeah, run with stick, jump over stick. <laughs> yeah, I, I, have, I have a sticker that that people can yeah. get. Um, I, can we talk a little bit about um, just the mental health system as like sure. a whole? Because um, I've I've I don't want to say I have a. I'll say it. I have kind of a bad taste in my mouth with it in a lot of ways, um, mm-hmm. and I I don't. And I'm I'm trying really hard to have empathy for it, as you can maybe you can tell I'm working on my empathy for <laughs> for things mm-hmm. I don't like, but it's it's like as a kid I just don't know if there was enough information or or knowledge out there about what's really going on in mental health, and I still like when I was in the I was just telling my wife this when I was in the uh, outpatient program in 2012 they literally brought us into a room and gave us a PowerPoint of how SSRIs work. And at the end they were like, and we don't know exactly why it works the way it does. We just know it does, but we're Mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. And it was the first time anyone told me that we're kind of at the edge and we, we don't know the brain's complex. That's essentially Mm -hmm. what they were saying. And we're trying our best, but we don't, we don't know how it works. And so I, I guess I'm asking is, do you run into issues at all with like the system as a whole or um I'll, I'll i'll give you one more story we i had a friend reach out to me a few years ago who said he was suicidal wanted help and he knew i was in uh that outpatient program treatment so he asked what to do so i had him come over to our house um just to keep an eye on him it seemed like the right thing to do and then it, we started calling places to get him in and we called six or seven places and they all said it's going to take three months to get you in uh, to get help. And we remember sitting there going, he's suicidal now. Like, mm-hmm. we don't know if he's going to be around in three months. What are we supposed to do here? And they're like, you can call, you can call um, the ER and maybe they can get in there. But that's a, that's about it. So that's what we tried to do is call the ER. And they're like, well, he doesn't seem like he wants to hurt himself. And then a lady came up to me, be like, took me aside and goes, just tell me he's going to, you think he might hurt himself just so we can get him in. Cause I, I see what you're trying to do, but this, there's no other way to get him in unless you say this. And if he really wants, cause he came willingly, he's like, mm-hmm. let's, let's do this. And that's what we had to do to, to, to get him some help instantly instead of wait three months and mm-hmm. see where he's going to be. And so that, has created a lot of distrust in me with a system. I know there's people like you and I've, I've ran in some fantastic therapists who have helped me, but it seems like this, this, the system isn't that great. And you've been in it longer than I have. So I'm just wondering if you can speak. That, on that I, a little bit. I, I agree about the system and it's kind of set up like that. You, you call for help and it's like, yeah, I can get you in and, um, November, like around Thanksgiving and here, you know, it's September and that's often the case. Then you have to jump through these hoops again Mm -hmm. and people shouldn't have to learn. Like if I want to get help, I need to say that I, I think I'm going to hurt myself and you know, whether they think that way or not, but those are like the magic kind of buzzwords, you know, that, that the system has, I, I, I wish I had some answers as to how, I mean, one of the things I know that is being talked about, um, and again, it's a little bit off a, like a different path, but no, that's cool. when they're talking about the, you know, the whole like defund the police thing came out and it's like, that's just the, that's really the, not the right term. I, you know, if they would have used yeah. a different term, like reallocate funds, um, that perhaps on certain calls they can have uh, mental health professionals go to those calls, you know, and I, some places are starting to do that now and where, you know, people can get help. Uh, again, a lot of those people, they, they don't trust people in uniforms and right. um, not to say that, I, I mean, I know some, some awesome police officers and some awesome correctional officers, but, you know, in general, like the, the training's a little different and, you know, their job is something else. Like they, they need to be able to do their job. They don't need to be mental health therapists too when they come across 
someone having a mental health crisis. So, you know, I, that's one way, um, I, like the backlog at hospitals. I, like, I, I really don't know. Um, is that the problem though? There's just too many people who need help and just not enough therapists or I, I, spaces. It's starting to look that way. Cause like yeah. every therapist I know their schedules are just booked. Yeah. And, and I couldn't, and, and you, re, you do this for a living. So yeah. I would imagine if you have a client who might have to come in once a month or every two weeks or every two months or something, you have a set number of clients. Mm -hmm. And if you add someone else in there, you're either taking a space from work you're doing with the per current person or mm -hmm. you're kicking them out altogether. And I would imagine, how do you make those calls? You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I have, and I, it seems like it's a, on a weekly basis. I'll be um, contacting people asking, you know, can, if they're, and usually I, I've met with a lot of them for a while. So I know like when they're available and if there are people who are a little bit more available, I can contact them and say, Hey, can we meet at this time this week or this day instead of this one? And for the most part, I, the people who are able to do that, you know, you know can do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, so then I can fit, you know, somebody else in there, but, that's kind of how it is now. Um, but the, um, you know, I guess, you know, ta talking about your friend and going to the ER, you know, if you wanted me to share that story of, of mine, that I talked <laughs> yeah, about on the phone. Yeah, I would, I would um, love it. I would love to. Because that, you know, that was a stretch. And again, it's all, it's all part of my journey. And I think it again, has led me to this place where I have meaning and purpose, but, um, I'm a person who, uh, like, I guess they would call a, a wounded healer. It's someone who has dealt with uh, my own issues too, for most of my life. Um, I've had anxiety and I've had depression and panic attacks like for um, most of my life. And I wouldn't really say anything. And I tried to like be the, you know, the typical male, like, you know, I'll suck it up, you know, yeah, rub feelings some dirt on it. <laughs> Yeah. And, but I, you know, I got to a place where, um, I was just, for me, like the, the panic attack symptoms like mimicked a heart attack. And so I had every symptom. I mean, I, I would start like the, the kind of sweats you get when you have the flu, um, to like left side, like pain and numbness. Um, I couldn't take a complete breath and there's a distinction on that one like people say oh you couldn't breathe no it's not that i couldn't breathe i couldn't complete my breath and mm -hmm. there's a difference that that seems to be a big sign for like anxiety and panic attack like you can't you know like that and yeah. and every time i would get to that i would start like breathing like that and i'd get these other symptoms well then the panic would start and for me, it was always like at night, like late at night. And so I wouldn't sleep. I'd get up, I'd just pace around and I would try and sleep and I couldn't. And I just up, you know, down. And um, obviously not like my wife can't sleep either because I'm doing this. <laughs> and I went through a, like a stretch uh, where it was probably like a two week stretch where I don't know if I actually slept at all. It was the same thing. And in this stretch, I, three times I got up and went to the emergency room and, um, wow. and like, luckily I only, I live a block and a half from the hospital. And so, um, I would go there and then they would like run some tests and hook me up with some, you know, electrodes they'd put on me and they'd come back. My tests would be normal and they would tell me, well, either either you have anxiety or irritable bowel syndrome. And so it's one or the other, like, I don't know which one. And a lot of times, then they give me Xanax and send me home. And hmm. the third time of this, you know, this trifecta, I, I went there and um, when, and again, it's like, it's like two or three in the morning. And so I'm, I go to the ER and they put me in like, uh, I guess they weren't rooms. They're just like cubicles. And then they have a 
uh, curtain that goes in in front and they you know they do the same thing as always they, they give me oxygen they you know start running some tests on me and then you know then they leave me sitting there while they're waiting for the results of the test and so they pull the curtain and like this particular night I was just sitting there like I I didn't like they there's a tv in there and they would always have the TV on. Well, this night I turned it off for whatever reason. And um, so I was just sitting there. And then um, again, it's the middle of the night. There's really nobody there and except like the doctor and the nurse. And for whatever reason on that night, they decided to like stand at the nurse's station right in front of my, like my cubicle in front of my curtain and, you know, proceed to start talking about me and, again, there's no noise, there's no TV on in, in my uh, little area there. And so I'm listening to them, like make jokes about me and they, uh, and they're laughing. They're like, uh, one of them said, look, can you believe like this guy is a mental health therapist? It's like, who would go see him? He's crazy. And like, he thinks this and then, and then they're laughing, you know? And, um, so, I mean, I was tempted at the time, just like pull the oxygen thing off and everything and just like run out there and confront them. But I you, didn't. You're having a panic and, attack too. But right? yeah, I'm having, and so <laughs> something in me clicked and I just said, maybe for once you should practice the things that you teach other people. And I was always like, I'm the therapist. Uh, so like this stuff doesn't apply to me. Um, it's, I'm teaching you this cause I'm, I'm the therapist. So therefore there's nothing wrong with me. And, and whatever happened that night, I, I was just, okay, I'm going to practice some of these techniques, these kind of mindfulness techniques to just acknowledge what I'm thinking and feeling and just let it go. And, and it, so I did, I, I went through the whole gamut. You know, I was, I think the, my initial reaction was I was ticked off. I was angry. And so like, if they would have came back in the room, then my reaction would have been a whole lot different. You know, there would have been um, like yelling or whatever. Uh, but that was my first reaction. And then I started to think to myself, um, what if they're right? You know, like, you know, God, you know, who, who would go and see me, you know, who would come to, to me for their problems when I, and I, I maybe I am, maybe I'm crazy. Um, and as, so I acknowledge that thought and, and that one passed through and by the time they came back in there, I was at a completely different place. And, um, so they came and I knew what they're going to tell me the same thing. They told me the last time, well, you're, you know, we can't find anything. So, um, so here you go. It, you know, it's either anxiety or irritable bowel syndrome. So uh, go on your way. So when they came in the for, and usually I'm quiet. I like just want to just get me out of here. And, but this time I just, they sat down, they looked at me and I just looked at them and I said, you know, um, those curtains aren't soundproof. And they're like, what? Like they thought I just like was talking out of the top of my head. <laughs> you're being crazy. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, just, I said, just so you're aware, you know, the, the curtain in front of there uh, isn't soundproof. I said, I, I heard everything that you said and they're, you know, they're kind of trying to, de 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 uh, to deny it, you know, and it's like, uh, what do you mean? I don't know. And so then I kind of started to repeat back to them the things that they had said, you know, and, I said, you know, like laughing, joking. And I said, I, you know, I get it. I work in a prison. Um, it's gallows humor, you know, but I said, usually I will go off to some other place and to do that, not in front of people. Um, I said, you know, that's a way to cope with the things that you see all day. I said, but um, I said, one of the things you said is, okay, why would people go to see this guy? He's crazy. I said, so I started to think, why would people come and see me? And I said, Maybe that's precisely why they come and see me. You get it. Because yeah. I, I get it. I, I know what it's like to feel this way. And 
I would imagine that comes across to people I work with, you know, that oh, like, sure. okay, this guy has something, you know, he, he understands what it's like. And, um, and then I said to him, I said, I, I really, I said, I, I don't, I said, you know, why did I come here? I said, are my thoughts rational? No, no, that's why I'm here. And um, I don't know what I was looking for. Uh, maybe some validation, someone to just tell me it's going to be okay. I, I really don't know. I said, but um, I said, one thing I'll tell you is uh, I'm really, I said, I don't look at this as a curse. I look at it as a blessing. And I said, I'm really glad it's me who is, has this and not you. I said, because with a mindset and an attitude like that, I said, you would never be able to handle this. I said, I, if you've never had a panic attack, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And, and I kind of, you know, I went off a little bit more and I just said, you know, I, when you work in an ER, the majority of people that you meet with, especially in the middle of the night, the people who come to the ER are coming here because of like either like a drug overdose or something or panic attacks. It's that people have panic attacks and they, that this is where they come. And so I hope in the future, you know, you read up like more about what it's like to have a panic attack. And hopefully the next person who comes in here, like you won't do what you did tonight. And then they both were kind of sitting there with their mouths kind of open, like looking at me, like not knowing what to say. And I said, are, are my test results normal? And they said, yeah. I said, okay, I, I, think, I think I'm ready to go. And they're like, yeah, I think so. And I left there and I've never been back. And that was um, I would say like 12 years ago. Wow. And I've never been back. And it's not, and not to say I don't have panic attacks because I do. Yeah. But I'm. But do you I'm, handle them the same way you do now in that you were in the ER where you, you do the I, I things think you more, preach? Yeah. Now I do because now um, it's what uh, I like to say, you know, I can, I, I've learned enough tools. And again, like that's, that's what I was doing in prison for all the time, teaching people certain skills and, um, and to use these where I, now I, I'm at a place where I can have a panic attack uh, generally, like I could be in a group of people and no one would know. And, mm. but inside and it's could, chaos, but yes. outside. It's, and it's, it's, yeah. it's, it happened to me at work uh, a number of times where I'm in a session with someone and I'm having a panic attack while I'm in a session with them, but I've learned like tools. One of them is like, I really have to focus on them like what they're saying and what they're doing and you know mindfulness type so stuff yeah, to be very right? focused on the, the present. present yeah and um that works for me and not to say it works for everybody but that works for me and that works um, for me too actually like if if i'm depression's my big one you know that i, I mm -hmm. seem to slip into but um i i, I read a zen cone one or, or i was trying to do a year of zen medit or i did a year of zen meditation and that got it started with mindfulness and it was like, I'm going to go deep down this rabbit hole. But one thing that it's always helped me was someone asked a monk sometime, or maybe these are just stories. I'm not really sure, but it goes, how do you, how do you enter meditation? And he goes, close your eyes. So he's like, Oh, here we go. We're going to close my eyes. So he closes his eyes and he goes, what do you hear? And he goes, well, I hear a waterfall. He's like, enter through the waterfall. And <laughs> that, that like, that helps me out a lot because I, I meditate every morning and mm -hmm. I always start with that same idea is what do I hear right now? You know, I've tried, what do I feel? I've tried to focus on my breast, but for some reason, mm -hmm. like the, the auditorial things have helped me kind of anchor into the present moment more than anything else. So yeah. If you can use your yeah. senses, you know, yeah. any of your senses, and like the, the sense of smell is a really powerful one. Oh, if I should can, try that one. If you can more. smell certain things, you know, that, um, again, I would have more stories about that too. Like, and somebody, like I would work with people on, um, finding a safe place, you know, when, whenever they start to feel bad, it's like, okay, your safe place should be something, someplace where preferably where you've been and, um, where you felt 
safe and protected. And I would ask people to come up with this. And I remember one guy, uh, his safe place was at um, like his, like his grandmother's house. And I'm like, Oh, okay. What are you doing? And said, she's, uh, she's cooking food on the grill, you know? And it's like, okay, what is she cooking? And as he was telling me this, it's like, I was getting hungry. You know, it's like, yeah. I could, <laughs> I could smell the food. And it's like, yeah. and as he was explaining that, so uh, um, I guess I've learned that when you can associate smells with things that um, it can be a powerful tool when yeah. you're trying to find a safe place. And um, I, I struggle with smells only I've tried uh, all the senses and the smells are hardest for me. Maybe my sense of smell just sucks, but I feel like it doesn't change enough for me. Whereas, and then I know I'm just speaking obje uh, subjectively here, but for, for the audio stuff, like there's so many birds in a lawnmower or you know, cars driving by that something's constantly changing. And if I can predict mm -hmm. something that's going to happen, then that's, that's where I can kind of go into the future or to the past instead of kind of find that anchor. But mm -hmm. that smell one, I, mean, I might have to try that again. <laughs> There's, it's probably the same, right? I, I'm sure smells change mm -hmm. in volumes. It's, all, it's also, a, um, people associate that, a lot of times with trauma too. Oh, really? I, had, I've, I had people like um, that, like they didn't know why we're trying to do trauma therapy. And I remember one time a person, they, they were like really wanted to like attack a teacher at the, this is at prison hmm. and couldn't figure out why. And then as the more we did therapy, realized that like uh, that teacher wore the same kind of, cologne that like someone who abused this guy did wow and so he it just he associated that smell with abuse and like that kind of you know fight flight or freeze um mindset came in and um and yeah so he again a lot of times it's uh it can be like super a super powerful thing in both like trauma and in mindfulness too um uh, so but that, that works for me. And I, I know some, I also like to be in um, like in nature or outside. Like I oftentimes I walk around my neighborhood like late at night and um, I have an excuse now. I like, I take a dog for a walk and, <laughs> yeah. and I put you headphones can take yourself on for a walk though. <laughs> and um, my wife doesn't like me like taking a dog for a walk though. Cause I walk too far. And she's like, no, like the dog doesn't need to walk like a 10 K at night. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, um, but like in her case, uh, she like her mindfulness and my oldest daughter's mindfulness is on the back of a horse, mm. you know, that they, um, they love horses and they love to ride them. And, and so it's, I think, you know, people have to find out what, what it is for them. Um, but they're, they're Whatever you, I guess it's whatever you do. I know you had a segment on mindfulness, just like one of the previous podcasts where you talked a lot about mindfulness and, um, but it is, I think it's a very individual thing and you, and you find what works for you. And, yeah. um, and again, and well, it's, it's like the pole vault stuff again. I feel like you can't talk about it enough because there's so we're, every, everything's pointing to the same thing right? Just being mm -hmm. present. But there's so many different ways to get there. And by hearing all these different ways, maybe it'll help, you know, maybe someone listen to go, oh, I haven't even thought of it like that, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't even, when, when I did that year of Zen, there was like, there's walking meditations and there's humming meditations and there's ohms and there's all these, there's almost an infinite amount of ways to be present in the moment. And, you know, when I first learned it was focus on your breath, <laughs> you know, I thought mm -hmm. that was the only way. And it just, it didn't work for me. You know, it was too easy for me to get lost. You mm -hmm. know, well, I had one too. No, that, that actually, it reminds me of another funny one where um, that would be one breathing. And I'd always try and, you know, like breathe in for a certain count and then breathe out for like twice as long as I breathe in for yep. it. Um, then I, I went to a sem uh, training um, educational session on uh, tapping uh, emotional freedom technique EFT. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this. And uh, then one night I was in like trying, we're trying to go to sleep 
and I'm doing that. And my, all of a sudden I look and my wife's looking at me. She's like, what are you doing? It's like, you're, you're like hitting yourself in the face. <laughs> and like, wait, so how, so what do you do exactly? Oh, it's like, okay. You know, you have uh, different pressure points on, on your, on your body that reduce tension. It's kind okay. of like, you know, acupuncture and acupressure. You use the same thing. Only okay. this one, like you take your finger and you tap on these places. It's like, I know for me, one of the big one is right at where my eyebrows end in the middle. Yeah. And it, and so I would, and it said you're supposed to relieve stress. I, you know, I don't know if it's similar to progressive muscle relaxation or something that, okay. um, but I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to try it. If, if it's, if it's someone says this works for anxiety, Give I'm going to try it. Yeah. And then it's like, she's like, what are you doing? You're just like hitting yourself in the face. And so then I thought, okay, this isn't going to work. Like it's too obvious. So then I, I taught myself acupressure. So it's kind of this, very similar except instead of tapping yourself so so sometimes i'm sitting in a chair like this and oh, so i have my finger it. and i can just like just like i'm thinking and i'm actually i'm taking my finger and just pushing it as hard as i can right into like a spot here like a pressure point and then you know you just for a you know a count of like seven or eight and then you let go and then when you let go it's like the tension goes away really and so i've yeah i've tried i've so i've tried all sorts of stuff, you know, that, and some hmm. of them are kind of comical, you know, that I also have, let's see if, I don't know if I can reach this, if it reaches over here. Um, but, oh yeah, it'll reach. So if you can see this, this is a, um, this is actually connected to my computer and it's, um, the stem it's, machine? A, it's a biofeedback oh. device. And okay. so what you do is you take this thing and these go on your fingers just like this. And um, then I have like seven or eight different programs. And so it's on your fingers like this. Whoops. And it came off, but it measures your, um, your heart rate, your pulse and how much you sweat. Really? And the, the programs, like they teach you like mindfulness type things. And, um, then they show nature scenes and stuff, but then you can click on it and it'll show like, like a hospital, like e, e cage, you know, the, one of those things. And, um, and it shows your, you know, in real time, it shows like how much you're sweating, um, what your heart rate is and, um, and your pulse. So what do you use it for, to, for like, um, it's different techniques to find what one works best for you. And you yeah, have it's, you're data supposed to, to just, yeah, you're supposed to just go through this. They have training things and then, um, and then there's like practice after each session. And the only way you can complete the task, it, it looks like a video game, but the only way you can complete the task is to have your, your heart rate low enough, you know, to, hmm. and then you can complete this task. And, uh, they had this in the correctional institution where I worked and really I was someone who like, I got bored because you know, they would, I would hook them up to this biofeedback and usually I'm just supposed to sit there and observe um, what happens. And then they, they would, in these sessions, like they have mentors um, and they're all like big name uh, people, you know, like in, in the um, like in the mindfulness world and um like Deepak Chopra is one of them. And they, so they give you lessons to, they tell you to practice your breathing and practice it. And then usually the instruction stops and, but you You're can continue, continue as long as you want. And so I, I remember like in one uh, case one particular individual, he was like, he was just nailing this. He could do this. Like it, it was nothing. <laughs> And so he was sitting there and I couldn't really keep my mouth shut, you know, and as he's sitting there. So I started talking to him and as about, you know, like, like why he, why he came from the institution he came from to, uh, to ours. And as we were talking about this, cause I, I really thought this guy was about ready to, to go back to where he came from and he was doing good. And, we were talking about like he had a beef with one particular individual at the other correctional facility. And so I brought that person up while, you know, he was hooked up to this on the computer and I was watching his heart 
rate on the screen. And all of a sudden it just went, you know, it's like <laughs> the computer exploded. Holy smokes. <laughs> it's like, and then he's looking at the computer screen and then it kind of just like, you know what? You haven't dealt with this as much as you thought you have, you know? And so it like, it was completely by accident. I started doing that all the time. I would hook them up to this biofeedback and I would Try and put it on that bit. screen. And then I would talk to them about stuff hmm. and they, but they all, they not only learned like what would increase their heart rate, they also learned what would, could decrease it as we, you know, we'd start talking about other things and try like techniques and like whether it was breathing or concentrating on something. And then they could, they could watch their heart rate go down, like right on the computer screen. And um, it never said that in any of the manuals for these biofeedback programs. It was just like completely by accident that I kind of discovered that. So the, I, I actually use this like that sometimes, you know, that's that, fascinating. Well, I have this book. I haven't read it yet, but you said you did the body keeps the score. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of the same idea that trauma is stored in your body or you have mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy but, from my understanding says the same thing, right? Like you have a physical reaction yeah. based on a thought or uh, an event that happened. So you can, for someone who's not doesn't have the awareness of that what's going on in their body, you can see a screen and see exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. Is that so? You, you kind of use it for yeah. that with your clients, right? Yeah. And then does that help where they could potentially down the road be able to, you know, have that awareness with their yeah, body and that, then make changes? So I've that's seen that because they they realize now they because they watch it on a computer screen they know that when they get riled up, if I do this it'll calm myself back down. And I actually learned that too. I, I did it, you know, I'd hook myself up and I would like, yeah, get worked up about things. And then I would try, okay, let's see if this will work and calm, calm myself down. And so like, I would do that, but yeah, here, this is, uh, this is a book. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly when I have, I, I, I buy books <laughs> Yeah, and then I, and I read them slower than I can, you know, buy, buy the next I have one. that one. I have, <laughs> what about, do you have this one? Oh, I read that one. Yep. Okay. I read Flow. Um, and have you... I, I should say that you got this one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that one is. <laughs> uh, yeah, Flow is fantastic. It, have you read, uh, oh, what's it called? Um, stealing or Catching Fire? Or maybe it's Stealing Fire. But I, they, don't, I don't think I've read that they, one. They take where the Flow research ends and then just blow it up down the rabbit hole where they bring in like uh, Navy SEALs and how they can learn to work in unison and with, with flow techniques together and how they can flow as a group versus just an individual. But mm -hmm. just to add another one onto your list, since I haven't read yeah. uh, Body Keeps the Score yet. Yeah, that one is because it it's um, – and it, I know that I told you too about go going to training for um, Reflexive Performance Reset or RPR, mm -hmm. which is also like a, a really interesting concept for athletes – and how they warm up and stuff that you like you warm up neurologically instead of, you know, muscularly. And, yeah. Um, and it, it looks like voodoo and that's what the <laughs> trainers say. They're like, what are you again? It's like, cause one of them is like, you, you go like this and you, you're, you just stimulate your, and it's like, Oh, okay. And it works. But when I went through the training, that's, that's what we were, the trainer and I were talking about when he found out that I was a mental health therapist. Cause it said, usually the people who are in these trainings are like, um, athletic trainers or physical right. therapists, um, or, um, coaches. And, and well, it's, I, that's why I was there for coaching, but, um, we ended up talking a lot about the, uh, trauma therapy. And he, and then that's when he told me, so they you know the, a lot of the, the RPR um, research is based on that book, The Body Keeps the Score. Hmm, really? That was kind of mind-blowing to me. And he said, well, just it's all like, the same, like, right? <laughs> just like, yeah, you're, like, your body re remembers trauma and, in, you know, and you feel it in certain places. You know, and, and like they uh, have developed techniques to like loosen up those places. Hmm. And, um, and it's all... Um, neurological you know it, it's um yeah it's 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 really it, it's fascinating to me and yeah and, you and, might have just put that book on top of my pile <laughs> once again <laughs> okay 
But yeah, you know, what you're talking about with with the athlete stuff, we used to do things called neuromuscular warm ups, and mm-hmm. kind of the same idea too is, yeah, you don't wake up the the muscular system, you wake up the central nervous system, mm-hmm. and f- so for like elite athletes, um, I used to get a lot of crap because I used to do a couple cleans or Olympic lifts in the morning before a competition, like, you're going to wear yourself out. You're like, no, I'm waking myself up. And it, mm-hmm. that's exactly what it does. Yeah. You know, and um, I mean, the body is just absolutely amazing. And I, I keep going back to like sports psychology or psychology. It's all, it's all psychology, which is, I mean, being hospitalized twice was a massive gift for me in a lot of ways. Um, but in coaching, it's helped me out more than, probably anywhere else just because I've coached a lot where mm-hmm. I've used some of these mindfulness techniques or I've used a lot of these other things with my athletes. And it's like, holy crap, it's worked with me and it's worked with them. It's like, mm-hmm. well, why aren't people talking about this stuff nearly as much? <laughs> you know? well, I think it's, it's made a difference with me too. It's like, I'm a much different coach than I was when I was younger before yeah. I, I went through a, uh, you know, a master's degree program. And before I learned all these things, you know, that I was, yeah, I was that coach that was always, you know, it was technique, technique, technique. And now it's like, it's uh, mostly is like mental and emotional. And again, I get a lot of people yeah. who, um, you know, I started off with like, um, like maybe one or two people who uh, wanted, just kind of reached out and asked for help with certain things. A lot of like were negative self-talk negative you know kind con- of yeah the, the ants. not believing in yourself <laughs> and it's like yeah and there would be people if you look at them on the outside you're like how can you not believe in yourself like and you're like one of the best in, in one case like the best pole vaulter in the entire state you know yeah. and, and it's like but it, it's very you know very much uh, negative self-esteem and um like mentally just not you know at meets you know they would lose their their focus and um what and like using some of these concepts um you know they're able to completely change things and like again i i saw results that were incredible you know like uh, uh, um in you know and in like one um athlete in particular is like it was so cool to see you know like like okay you were like really good before even even when like you know you 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 doubted yourself a lot and you know wondered you know uh, am i good enough and then you know and the end result came and it's like it's uh like everything that you would have wanted it to be it it was and you know so hopefully i'm you know i'm anxious to to follow you know along and and see you know what happens now uh from from here like their college journey as as opposed to a high school one and that's that's the part coaches seem to forget is it and i'm not saying you you are but you helped them have these tools in a sport which are going to help them outside of the sport tenfold mm-hmm. because sport sport ends eventually, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, but I, I've, I've always said like sports are just a way to learn how to, you know, do these bigger things in life, you know, or practice these tools or mm-hmm. how did, how did, I heard a, ment- or a martial arts guy say it's like sports are a, a tool for developing human de- human development or something like that around those lines. But mm-hmm. that's essentially what you're doing. You're giving them these tools to be successful in any place they go after mm-hmm. pole vault and in pole vault, which is. Yeah. I think it's a lot of it is too. It's like, it's more like life stuff. And, but I, yeah. I guess I, I have an advantage of having been a pole vaulter and a pole vault coach. So I can talk about technical things too. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times they do that. They'll send me that, like, their I'll have video of their vaults. And I, a lot of times I will do it, like, probably not to the caliber that you do, but I, yeah. I, I like screenshot certain things on videos and then I, I write stuff and send it back. And, and I, and for the most part, it's like, okay, this is, um, I like to show them like where they've improved. And it's like, see, right. you, now you're doing this and you're doing it. And, 
Well, it's so slow, right? Like that's what yeah. that's what kids seem to forget is how slow the prog because the sport's hard. <laughs> It's, yeah. not, it's not an easy sport. So you don't see it from day to day or week to week or even month to month. It's hard to see. But if you can, like, sounds like what you're doing, you take a video from last year of their plant mm -hmm. and you do one from now and you're like, those are completely different. But yeah. it's a year difference, you know. And, yeah, that you can see kids' minds be blown right, <laughs> right mm -hmm. in front of you when you do that. But I'm, I'm very, like, again, I, I talk softly. I'm, I, I guess if I had um, – people often ask me like who in the coaching world do you emulate? And I, I always come back to the same person and it's always, to me, it's Tony Dungy. Yeah. And, uh, just cause he's quiet and he is a, like a teacher and he talks softly and always positive. And yeah. um, so I like, that's kind of like my philosophy, how I do things. And, um, and, and again, it, is it, is that right for everybody? No. Uh, but it, it works for me because it, it fits with my personality and who I am. Yeah. I can't be that rah, rah person who like yells at people and who like that kind of stuff. That's never been me. And I, I think it would really come off disingenuous if I tried to do that. Yeah. So it's it, like, no, I just have to, you know, be me and figure out how to best, you know, be, who I am and help this person at the same time. Yeah. Being authentic with yourself, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're talking yeah. about at the beginning of this conversation is it's about connecting, but it's hard to connect with the character <laughs> that, yeah. that you're playing, you know? Uh, and I've run into that because uh, I, I go to like the Reno Pole Vault Summit and people expect like, welcome to the Pole Vault Vlog. My name is Sean and my hands are flying all over the mm -hmm. place. And then they talk to me like, you're not that you know, that crazy. I'm like, well, there's part of my personality where I can crank it up to 11 every once in a mm -hmm. while, but the, like that's I can't. That's not me all the time. Like this is more me than anything else. But hey, we're at an we're at an hour and 40. So oh, can yeah, can I can I ask you one more question and then I, and then I'll let you sure. let you get out of here. I'm sorry I kept you a sure. little over. No, that's all right. I was I haven't I haven't really been in my office in a year and a half. Oh the, really? The COVID. It's been like I do a lot of my sessions from my own basement. So this I I didn't want to be there because yeah. I have three dogs, and so right. it's like <laughs> you know it would be quiet. So I'm actually kind of enjoying sitting in my office. This is uh, again I don't know what you can see on your end, but this is kind of. Um, my philosophy too. That's I, my office. I want it to look like someone's living room. Yeah. And so I actually have a, I have a TV in here too. And, and, oh, really? Um, I, cause I wanted it like for therapy sessions for when someone comes here that they walk in and it feels to them like they're just like going to their friend's living room and they're going to sit and talk. So that's perfect. Um, and, and again, it's a safe place. Like my, the desk I'm sitting at right now is like pushed into the corner. So like, I don't sit behind a desk. I have a, a couch and a couple of recliners and a love seat and a coffee table and, and uh, you know, that kind of stuff around. So it, yeah. it, it's kind of who I am. And again, for, since COVID came, I, I haven't really done too many face-to-face uh, -face sessions. It's all been through video. So yeah, it's, it's kind of nice for me to come in here and, and realize how I have to clean quite a bit <laughs> before I have people <laughs> in here. Well, that, I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but there's, I, I, I've been reading a lot about like uh, what they're doing with this psychedelic psychotherapy and, mm -hmm. and things like that's just fascinating to me. But they were saying that I read some old research where they used to give people, whether it was psilocybin, um, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, or like I read this book called DMT, the spirit molecule, and they used to put them in a, a room, like a hospital room, and people would freak out you know, while they were doing it. And now mm -hmm. what they're doing at John Hopkins is putting him in a room that looks like your office and yeah. having him do it there. Cause it feels more comfortable in that home to do the actual treatment itself. <laughs> so you're, yeah. you're, it's like, you're doing it on, on a, a regular level instead of <laughs> throwing psychedelics yeah. down someone's throat. But well, yeah, I, I would imagine it helps you connect in that way yeah. more so than sitting behind but a desk. I always, I wanted people to feel like, you know, that, okay, they're not sitting there like wondering like what kind of techniques I'm using, <laughs> yeah. to, you know, for therapy. It's just a conversation. And then um, 
and again, to be subtle about it, like I'm not really explain exactly, you know, like what, uh, what I'm doing, why I ask certain things and, uh, why I talk about things. It's, you know, it has to flow naturally. <clears throat> and yeah. then at some point they're like, you know, I do we do feel anything? better. Yeah. I, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I just come, I, it's like I go to my friend's house and sit in his living room and talk. And for whatever reason, I, I start to feel better. And I mean, I think there's a lot to it than that. You know, I, it's, and I, I actually, I, I meet also with a lot of therapists. I have a lot of other therapists for clients really? and they, they all ha- like feel the imposter syndrome. It's like, what if they find out that I'm stupid or I don't know what I'm doing? And you yeah. know, that like, that's a, something that, I think everybody in this profession and probably most any other one deals with too, that yeah. um, if they, cause I don't feel like I'm doing anything. And I always say, you know, this is a, a field, the whole mental health field is it's qualitative. It's not quantitative. So it's hard to measure yeah. like success and, and, you know, like, and like in, in reading, you can measure, you know, like how, how well you can read, but in, in this area, it's, it's really difficult to measure. That, is, that, that was a question I didn't get to, which is like, what, what's your goal when you're doing therapy for these people is like, how do you, I, how do you know they're, you're going the right direction or. Well, well I, I have like certain things on my, I, again, I have the, like, it's not in this office, but my previous one, I had um, like motivational sayings and stuff that were in like that wall art Mm-hmm. And there were things up there like um, that. Um, well, I, I, I a few quotes. I have a couple here, you know, um, but like Victor Frankl uh, often said, you know, um, oh, yeah. it, it's um, he said the pursuit of happiness is often the very thing that thwarts it, you know, <laughs> and, and it's like, right. okay. So instead of pursuing happiness, maybe you, you know, because again, you can't, what happens when you get there? And so you can't right. be that way everywhere, but if you search for meaning or purpose, you know, that stays there. And, and so I, I uh, actually, even on my business card, it says like the me- the meaning of my life is to help you find meaning in yours. And so, so like, that's, that's kind of my as a therapist then yeah. to, to help people find meaning. Yeah. I try okay. and help them find purpose and meaning and, um, I guess one other concept that I use a lot is um, the concept of self-compassion. Okay. And, and I, I use that in sports quite a bit too. So self-compassion is like essentially treating yourself the way you would treat your best friend. And so like if a lot of times, you know, when and people come and they tell me things in therapy and they, they think negatively about themselves because of it, um, because I mean, as human beings, our minds skew negative anyway. And, yeah. you know, it, you could do nine things right and one thing wrong. And the only one you'll remember is that one. Right. And so, um, you know, oftentimes people talk about, I'd like to increase my self-esteem. And it's like, well, a lot of times to increase your self-esteem, you know, you, it's like, well, I don't really feel that good about myself, but, you know, I'm, I'm better than that guy over there. So like, it's comparing yourself to someone else. Yeah. And, self-compassion doesn't really do that. It's like you have compassion for yourself and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm okay. I'm human. You know, these things happen and that's okay. And I'm okay. I'm not going to get down on myself because I made a mistake. Um, right. I'm going to have, uh, again, if my best friend came and told me these things, you know, that I'm telling someone else, would I berate them? No. So like, why would I do that to myself? And yeah. so, but a lot of people do that. I'm just as guilty uh, as anyone, you know, I'm, I want, you're I, human. Uh, I want people to like me. Um, um, I mean, I, I have oftentimes people who say, um, or oh, I don't care what people think of me. Uh, Those are the people and, who care the most. So I've found, yeah, <laughs> I found, I really do care what people think of me. I want people yeah. to like me, but I also have, I, I've kind of changed my narration of that to say, um, I really care what people think about me, but in the, in the end, it doesn't really matter what they think about me because there are going to be people who don't like me. And that's a given, like not everybody in the world is going to like you and, yeah. and that's okay. 
because again, like you, like you don't like everyone else in the world either. So, um, right. but I, I, I really do like this uh, concept of self-compassion and, and I think that's lacking too. I think, you know, people oftentimes talk about self-esteem when they probably should be talking about self-compassion and hmm. just being nicer to themselves. Yeah. Give yourself a break, give yourself some credit. And it doesn't mean you don't want to strive to get better it, but to say, okay, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah. We could probably talk for another two hours on this. Cause like the, I've, I've wrestled with that. Cause a lot of my success on the outside of things has come from a really negative place, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for pole vault, for example, I would train because someone was going to train harder than me and someone was going to beat me and I was going to look stupid and I was going to mm -hmm. do all these things. So there's a lot of that like negative, uh, like feelings that don't feel very good that powered my, you know, success in, in mm -hmm. some ways, you know, in the pole vault space. And, and that's been common throughout a lot of my life. But as you said, that can, that compassion part, um, is, yeah, it's so much more important because even it just seems, yeah, I think you just lumped everything up into, into one thing. Like if you, most people see a failure and they take it as a hit negatively against themselves. But if you see it as, hey, I learned from this mm -hmm. and I can, that's what we do. And you know, I always, I always remind yeah. people, you wouldn't yell at a kid for falling off his bike the first days on it. So yeah. you know, why yell at yourself but for trying to that's, figure something that's out a whole too. other i mean you can go into the whole issue that we yeah. like didn't cover about like schools and right. teaching mental health in schools like and i say if someone um is uh falling behind in math well they get a tutor to help them or someone's falling behind in reading they get a tutor to help them someone has behavior issues they punish them yeah right and so it's like okay there, there needs to be like then that's a whole, I mean, that's a whole, would be a whole other podcast. Yeah, we'll that, have to do this again. <laughs> probably. But, yeah, yeah, I just, but I, I, I just I would talk like to my wife about that. I would like to say the one thing though, is that what, I don't know if it's everywhere, but I would say, believe so. Like in the, um, in the last couple of years, you know, since I've come back to being a, a pole vault coach, um, even as like an old man, you know, like I, like, I know I told you, I'd sent videos like, yes, I, on my 60th birthday, I four stepped 11 feet, you know, and yeah. like, okay, I can still do it, you know? And, and, um, I, I, you know, who knows, I may try a longer run and get higher, but this whole world and the, like the pole vault clubs are things. And I, I have relations, you know, relationships with a number of the people who run pole vault clubs. And I have, um, being in those places with, with those individuals has actually helped me a great deal in my mental health world too. Same. I, yeah. I, like, um, I, I mean, I love being there and the, the ones that I know, and I don't know if, the, if, if I, if I throw out names, it's not a HIPAA thing, but yeah. like th these, these guys, like I, I work mostly with, there's like two clubs in Wisconsin and, and one of them, the, the club owner's name is Barnaby and the other one is um, Johnny Graham. And I, I think, you know, they're pretty well known in these circles, but yeah, those guys, I learned so much from watching them and how they interact. And it's like, they have like amazing pole vaulters there, but to watch them work with the ones who are either just starting or people who in a lot of other places, they would say, you should never try pole vault. Yeah. yeah. You would never try. You're, you're too slow. You're too this. And it's like, man, I, I watch them and it's like, I'm incredibly inspired by, you know, someone uh, and who can, you know, you take someone who you like really, Oh, you don't think they, they're never going to get off the ground or make a height and they might go like their entire, you know, a couple of years. And then all of a sudden they, they make a height or two or three and like, they're not going to be state champions, but you see the joy in, in them. And to realize that, you know, this particular coach uh, stuck with them and takes as much joy 
in their success as they do, you know, state champions or something. I mean, that's, that's so cool. Like I, yeah. I can, those two guys I consider, you know, I, and I'm sure there are people everywhere, but they're the two I know in Wisconsin. They're just amazing. And well, it's like uh, Steve White used to say all the time, the pole vault is some people, how does he say it? I'm going to butcher it now that I'm thinking about it, but sometimes the pole vault, no, some people are good for the pole vault, but most of the time the pole vault is good for the people. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, I think that's exactly what you're, talking yeah. about is just because you're not going to be a state champion doesn't mean the mm-hmm. sport can't be yeah. a positive thing in your life. Yeah. And, and they can take those lessons that they learned and use them in other areas of life. Exactly. So I promise I, you, this is my, my last question. Right. <laughs> but, I, I should tell one thing quick. Yeah. Steve, Steve White, <laughs> yep. he, he pole vaulted at North Central. Yeah. Yeah. I was the coach at UW Oshkosh when he pole vaulted at North. Get out of here. Really? That's <laughs> I, awesome. I, he doesn't know me, but I know who he is. He was, he was yeah. really, really good. That's awesome. A division three pole vaulter who probably should have been division one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Steve but, and Caroline are some of my favorite people that I've, I, that I've ever I do. Met. I follow them. I read a lot of their stuff. It's awesome. Yeah. They're, they're the, they're the best. I, I mean, they were at my wedding, you know, cause uh-huh. they were that important to me, but yeah, I, I honestly, yeah, I should tell them. <laughs> I try and tell them as much as I can how much they mean, but they're probably sick of it. Um, but last question here. Um, if you if you had like a magic wand or you were in control of all of mental health or whatever, what, what would you change or how would you make it look or what would you do to help correct a lot of these issues that are here? Um, the, the first thought that comes in, like immediately came into my head is, is to – figure out a way to end the stigma that it's that there's something wrong with you. Like if people are reluctant to reach out to a therapist. Cause they think, Oh, if I go to a therapist, that means a I'm crazy or, you know, something else that it's because something's wrong. And my thought is that, you know, everybody ought to have someone that they can talk to and, and it's being a, um, with a therapist a little different than talking to your friends, you know, yeah. again, like you, um, friends uh, to have friends that you can talk to are, is fantastic, but a therapy I session think. is different. Yeah. You know, it, it's cause someone to, you're talking to someone who's focused on you okay. and, you know, uh, a lot of times with friends, it's a lot of give and take and, um, but I think, you know, there's a stigma there that people don't want to reach out. And I've, I've talked to a lot of people that have told me that they're like, I, I didn't really want to reach out for help because um, there's just like this whole negative thing. Like the, there's a stigma that, yeah, there's something tremendously wrong with me because I can't manage, you know, my situation like, like, you know, Jimmy does over here and, but I, I always tell people, well, you don't know what Jimmy's right. like behind closed doors either. I also, I also think part of it is, you know, I, I, I was meditating the other day and I thought about this where, you know, people go, well, you'd go see somebody if you had a broken leg, mm-hmm. you know, um, why can't we do that for our brains? And I used to say that and then it hit me like, but a lot of us associate who we are with our brains. So mm-hmm. instead of like an arm being broken, you're going... I am broken. And that's kind of the message. I think a lot of people are either hearing or they're, they think that's going on, but, but it, it seems like it, it would help if you go, well, thoughts are kind of like your bone, <laughs> you know, that's, you're not your thoughts. You're not all these, you're what's maybe watching these thoughts. If you, if you're doing the mindfulness kind of way of looking mm-hmm. at this, or if there's another way to go, you know, you're just as much your bones as you are your thoughts, you know, and then you mm-hmm. can kind of tie it that way. But I, I've, I've just kind of become aware of that disconnect that, especially in Western society, where you are located in your body, most people point to their head. Mm-hmm. Like I'm in here, you know, where maybe Eastern societies are like, maybe they're in their heart or yeah. their gut or something, which it just hit me. And, and so I think that a lot of the stigma comes from that mm-hmm. alone. That's where like a lot of trauma treatment does that. Like um, EMDR, for example, it, it, it takes these things out of your brain and puts them into your body. And okay. then you can, you know, focus on them, concentrate on them. And then they, 
do something called bilateral stimulation where you activate both sides of your brain at once. And huh. it allows this to pass through because um, I guess trauma is essentially unprocessed memories, you know, that you, you know, it, it's, that's why people who have experienced trauma, a lot of times you can, um, even if it was 50 years ago, you, you can still remember things. And, and that's why, you know, certain people like smells, um, touch, sounds, certain things will affect people years later. And it's because um, like this memory wasn't processed the way a normal memory gets processed, that, that hmm. it stayed there. Like if your amygdala was activated, which um, you can go, you can go Google that all like to type in the word amygdala hijack and watch videos of people who just like, you know, that, yeah, they were, um, that part of their brain took over and, and um, but those, that's where those memories stay. And so then they, what happens is they get triggered by something in the present that triggers these past memories. And then you go right back to where you were then. And so you're essentially like re-traumatizing yourself over again. So and, just create a loop then. And then they just keep repeating yeah. like the same patterns over and over yeah. again. So then what you do as the, a therapist is help process it, kind of like poke a hole in the trauma mm -hmm. bubble. <laughs> yeah. I'm a visual, I'm a visual guy. So I'm creating like bubbles yeah. in my head, but then it kind of dissipates and you can move forward from that and yeah. stop the pattern. That's essentially they, how that works. They, I've, I've learned too. They talk about like, okay, like you're, you're a file cabinet, like you're, your body and your mind is a file cabinet. And what we're going to do is we're going to, your, your files are all, none of them are in order. So we're going to open the drawer. We're going to take out your files and look at them and put them back in the proper order and then shut the door. And, and so it's, I so mean, with, I know it's an analogy that it's, it's not really that easy, but. But know, with that analogy, is it like, so your, your file, your file is something that happened maybe when you were 10, mm -hmm. but you're repeating it now. So essentially yeah. you can put it back and reprocess it yeah. when you were 10. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And there's all sorts of different kinds of techniques that, you know, that, that, that are out there that like EMDR is one. There's another one called brain spotting. There's, you know, like, um, there's a, oh, well, and one of them that where you kind of visualize like you're in a movie theater and you're on the screen, you're watching a movie of your life. And, um, and then you can, you know, there's other ways that you can kind of insert yourself into that movie. And, so is the know, idea to not be as connected to it? Like you're looking at yeah. it more objectively. I just, I just listened to a podcast with the guy from maps who like, more psychedelic research stuff but they said that's essentially what mdma is doing for people it's, it's allowing you to see the, this trauma without having the emotional response to it mm -hmm. so you can process it but yeah. which it's fast so that they're, they're all just trying to do the exact same thing is just yeah process different, this trauma. different ways okay and then uh, yeah there's a, they're all out there and there's like another one called prolonged exposure where you you know you're kind of Oh that's like when you hold a spider or something when you're, Yeah. Okay. And uh but yeah there there's um there's quite a you know and, and again it, it it's really to, to find what works for you and, and so like that's why, you know, therapy it can't really be a you know like you try and fit everybody into a certain peg cuz Yeah you there's more than one way to therapy <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah huh. just like yeah just like there's there's different ways to pole vault there's <laughs> yeah. different ways to do therapy too but that seems to be the common denominator what you just unraveled this thing like i feel really excited because like I, I had no idea that that's what all of these were trying to do is just find the trauma and help you process it mm -hmm. in in the present but i would imagine there's a lot of resistance to that too for people yeah. because it's not comfortable right and no it, it's it, it's extremely uh, uncomfortable and that's why people tend to quit you know at, at a certain point in therapy that like there's a there's a place that the, the term is called the extinction burst it's like when things get worse before they get better yeah and you know so you start therapy and then you start bringing this stuff up and you go like down here and then you're like, well, this is just making me worse. Yeah. And then they quit. But it, it's that concept is, you know, things get worse 
but they have to in order to get better because you or else you're, you're just kind of <laughs> you're going like you're going along here and you're never going to get any higher than this plateau but if you start doing this work yes you're going to go like this but when you come back up you're going to come back up like way up here and it's like periodization in track and field or training then essentially yeah, yeah. there there huh. i know there are a lot of concepts that are well, the body, you, we just keep, similar. We keep saying it, right? Like the body keeps the score. It's like the body mm -hmm. and the brain are, they're not separate, which is what I was taught when I was younger. You know, it's, mm -hmm. they're very much interconnected, working together. Huh. But I've, I've told people quite a bit in therapy, you know, as a therapist, it's uh, tough to watch someone go through this. You know, it, it's, it's like, I, and so I try and tell them like, it's, yeah, you're going to go through hell but I also know, and, and it just, it kills me to see this, but I also know that what happens at the end, if you stick with it is well worth this. Yeah. And, and again, like you have to kind of convince yourself that, that, you know, keep that focus on, on and again, very, very similar to sports that you, you know, you focus on and tell yourself that I have to it. go through this now <laughs> to get to where I want to go at the end. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's neat when it happens, you know, but it, it's hard when you're like right in that, you know, and yeah, I, I hopefully at some point you can look back and say, you know, like your joy is in the journey because th that journey is going to teach you a lot of things. And I, I, I think of myself that uh, a lot, like all the things I've gone through, it's like, like that movie, Benjamin Button, there's <laughs> one scene where. Um, he like he replays everything where the like that she gets hit by the car and then he goes all the way back and he said well if this guy wouldn't have stopped and gotten the paper if this person wouldn't have done this if this so everything had to happen exactly the way it did for things to be exactly the way they are and yeah. that's the way it's supposed to be and you might not like it at the time but at some point like this, this conversation wouldn't be happening if everything in both of our lives hadn't happened exactly the way it did. Exactly. So, yeah. And as you're explaining this, I keep thinking, and that's where I've been able to find empathy for what things that have happened in my past and the way like I react now is, you know, if this didn't happen to me, I wouldn't have depression or this anxiety kind mm -hmm. of ideas like, and so instead of fighting it, which I feel like that's helped me too, is instead of trying to fight it like I have my entire life, I've just gone, it's probably there to help me. You know, like the body's pretty freaking cool, but it just mm -hmm. got hijacked at some point, you know, and yeah. it's running way too high, way too fast and way too hot. <laughs> you know, where, you know, I, I really do think, and, and I could be wrong here, but I'm, I've started to have this idea that maybe I don't have depression I'm experiencing depression you know it's those big dips mm -hmm. and instead of treating it the trauma or what was causing it i was treating the symptoms and that's why it hasn't gone mm -hmm. anywhere and it's kind um, of like the, the band-aid approach uh, you look at the symptoms and not the cause and then, uh, yeah and that's what i feel like people have done most of my life ever since i was a kid was let's get the mm -hmm. meds right you know and even yeah. on the meds it was always it feels like nothing's changing. It's just, everything's duller, you know? Like yeah. The, it's still I, I hear that a lot in sessions yeah. and people are like, Oh, you take them to take the edge off, but it also, it kind of, yeah, you kind of go along like this. You don't feel happy. You don't feel sad. You just feel nothing. And that's, that's and, the other is I, I used to fight meds too all the time. Cause I was like, these are bad. They're bad for me. You know, I'm just helping big pharma. And now mm -hmm. <laughs> I've kind of gone, Oh man, they're, they're there as like a tool to help you know and i mm -hmm. haven't i wasn't using the tool correctly whereas yeah. if you can work on the cognitive behavioral therapy or you know emdr a lot of these other things you were talking mm -hmm. about seeing a therapist and processing this trauma without the intense emotions making it mm -hmm. harder to do it and then helping on the trauma side and then the meds yeah. can maybe dissipate down the road and no one ever explained that to me until i started doing these podcasts and talking mm -hmm. to experts instead of family doctors or i'm i'm not anti-med at all because sometimes neither, yeah sometimes I, I think taking the meds are what allows us to do therapy because there's exactly, people yeah. who can't do it um unless they're in you know in that state that the meds allow them to be able to do therapy yeah and so, um 
So I yeah, bought- I'm not an anti-med. I've been on, I've been on uh, my share of meds too. And yeah. um, I've also heard it the other way where some people just don't want to face their trauma. And, so, yeah. and if that's their choice, then, you know, maybe a med is, is something that can at least dull it down enough to get through life the way they want to, which is their yeah. choice in the end. Well, that, uh, that makes me think of something that, um, that they always say, well, you can like in regards to take meds or not take meds or mm-hmm. do therapy, not do therapy. And, you know, I say, well, I've had people tell me this, that, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. <laughs> right. And then I, I have a comeback to that. I always say, but my job's not to make them drink. It's to make them thirsty. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, and I love like, that. And so that's, so then he'll drink on his own. You know? Yeah. And so that's kind of like. So you're providing I, I, hope essentially yeah, at that point and showing them yeah, a life I, that. I don't want to make them. Yeah. I don't want to make him drink. Cause no, you'll drown your horse. Yeah, I want to make him thirsty. <laughs> yeah. I think let's end it on that. That was, that was absolutely right. perfect. I think. Well, I, I have one, I have one more. Yeah, I have to tell you this because I'm looking at this all night and it's like right behind my computer screen and this quote that just sits there and I have it on, in a frame on my wall. And, and so it says um, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. That's Elizabeth Kubler Ross. And oh. that, I mean, and I think of, um, and, you know, because it's staring at me when I'm doing this podcast, and I'm thinking, you know, you're, your life story, you know, you've put this out on, um, always that ever since I've been, you know, following your videos and stuff, you put this out there and it's people who have been in situations like you, you never asked to have this, you know, you never, um, but because of, what you're doing with this now, you know, by you climbing out of the depths, you have developed this, uh, this, you know, this compassion, this concern, uh, gentleness for other people that in turn helps them. And so like from the, the pole vault videos to the, you know, the other, I mean, you've made almost like documentary videos that you've done too. And and, (laughs) um, it's, a lot of that is you're sharing your journey, you know, with the rest of us. And um, that's why I think, you know, you doing this is going to do tremendous things for the mental health profession. And I'm just like honored and privileged to be able to, you know, to have you ask me to be a part of it. Oh, I'm, I'm again, honored. You, you shared your time with me. Like this is, I, I, if I would have known that you would unlock parts of my brain within like two hours, I would have done this way sooner. I had said no idea what we were going to even talk about today. <laughs> it's been an absolute treat. Holy macaroni and cheese, Batman. How, what did you think about that podcast? <laughs> Let me know in the comments on some social media someplace or shoot me an email. I'd love to know what you thought. Steve is an incredible guy. Go, go check him out. Fox River Counseling Center. Yes, go check him out. He is fantastic. Uh, and it's just an amazing human being. Um, to support this, uh, you can head over to onewholelifemedia.com. Check the show notes. Uh, Steve provided all sorts of show notes for you guys uh, and resources of his favorite mental health resources, books, articles, things like that. And uh, to support what I'm doing here, One Whole Life Media, get a shirt. It helps support it. Let me know about the Patreon thing and share these around. If you, if you find a, a section that you might like, Share it off to a friend. That'd be great. Or put the podcast and repeat and just leave it there for a week. <laughs> All right, everybody. Life's meant to be experienced and curiosity will get you there. I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.